it's with great, great pleasure and sincere honor that I welcome each and every one of you to the 2024 Global Sustainability Partnerships Defining a Legacy Summit. So my name is Luis. Uh, I'm the president of the Global Sustainability Partnerships. For, uh, for those that are joining for the first time, our Global Sustainability Partnership Program falls under the WCPSCN's fourth pillar of global sustainability. So together we've embarked on a quite remarkable and impactful journey towards promoting our four principles of practice pillars, uh, which are uh, community development, women's health, education, and of course, global sustainability. Um, through the fourth pillar, we strive to forge global alliances and maintain connections that empower uh, one another projects, sustainable businesses for measurable impacts, and action in our communities um, and beyond. So today marks our fourth annual summit, uh, and I continue to be inspired by the diversity, the, the passion, uh, and, and global presence that this summit brings together. So I really look forward to discussing today's topics and getting to know more about each of you, our impactful change makers, the organizations and businesses dedicated to a sustainable future. So as I often say, <clears throat> doing nothing is not an option. So together we've, we have uh, the power to drive meaningful change um, and as I believe now more than ever, the time for action um, is upon us. Whilst we recognize the gravity of the challenges we face, it's equally important to find moments of levity and connection. So during our pursuit of a better and more sustainable future, we must also find joy in our shared journey. So together we can be a movement that brings positive change to our communities and beyond. So again, <clears throat> before we proceed, I would like to uh, extend a massive, massive thanks to our wonderful speakers, our board of trustees uh, and its president, uh, Karen Singh, our vice president of global sustainability, Augustina, um, and our esteemed moderator, Tina Greenbaum. Without all of them, today's summit would really not be possible. So again, thank you, thank you all once again for joining us today. And it's now my pleasure to give the floor to Karen Singh, President of our Board of Trustees. Hi everyone, good afternoon from Portugal. And uh, my name is Karen Bhatia and uh, I'm a Group CEO of Hello 9X and a Board President for WOCPSCN. So, First of all, it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome you all to this event dedicated to critical topic on uh, global sustainable partnerships. Today we gather to explore how collaborations across border sectors and discipline can drive us towards a more sustainable and equitable future. In the era marked by unprecedented environment challenges and social inequalities. The need for global cooperation has been more urgent. Sustainable partnerships are not just a strategic choice, they are a necessity <clears throat> for our collective survival and prosperity. By working together, sharing knowledge, and leveraging our diverse strengths, we can tackle issues such as climate changes, resource depletion, and social injustice. With great efficacy and impact, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to our distinguished guest speaker who have graciously agreed to share their insights. Everybody, please mute until you're actually speaking. That would be really great. Thank you. Go ahead. I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to our distinguished guest speakers who have graciously agreed to share their insights and expertise with us today. 
Their dedication and pioneering work in their respective field inspire us all and serve as a beacon of hope and progress. Your presence here is a testament to our, your commitment to making a difference. Let us take this opportunity to engage in a meaningful discussion, forge new partnership and renew our collective commitments to building a sustainable future for all. Thank you once again to our esteemed speakers and to our all the guests here to part of this important event. Together we can turn ideas into action, aspiration into achievement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Lewis, do we have anybody else to uh, speak before our speakers? Yes, I think uh, it would be great for uh, Augustina uh, as well to, to present herself as our great uh, Global Sustainability Partnership Vice President as well. Thank you. Um, I just want to chat. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone. Good afternoon from Bali, Indonesia. It's already very late here, like uh, 2 a.m. in the morning. And welcome to the annual JASP Submit 2024. Although we are conducting this submit on online and separated by distance, mm -hmm. but our shared commitment to global sustainability remains strong and unwavering. I want to begin by um, apologize for my inactivity lately, but I'm so honored here uh, today addressing such a dedicated group committed to advancing global sustainability. First of all, I would like to extend my special thanks to Mem Loretta Green Williams, the founder of WCPCN, for her inspiring leadership contributions to our cause, and then for Mr. Luis Majoris and also Mr. Uh, Karan Singh Bata from the WCPCN Board of Trustees. Thank you so much for your hard working for organizing this submit. Very appreciated. And our moderators today, Mem Tina and also Ms. Junian Lewis, if she is already here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your contributions. And now forget to our outstanding guest speakers. Thank you so much for your commitment. I mean, yeah for enthusiasm in sharing your perspective in today's submit. I also want to extend a warm welcome to all the participants here for joining the submit. Your presence here really reflect, reflects the commitment to sustainability and your desire to make a positive impact in our world. So in today's submit, I let's use this opportunity to strengthen our connection and also our innovative ideas for the future success of uh, this uh, this world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Augustine. Thank you. I see we, we, we may be ready for our first speaker. Is that correct? Yes, wonderful. Well, I wanna welcome you all from around the world and appreciate the time zones. I'm kind of lucky it's only 20 to 10 in the morning. So, so I'm nice and fresh. However, we have this lovely, lovely first speaker who, her name is Zara Rilaya Wang. Did I say it right, Zara? Zara Rilaya Wang. Well, yeah. There we go. <laughs> so let me tell you just a little bit about her, and she's going to tell a lot more about herself. Zara's participation in interreligious discussions includes Buddhism, Buddhism leadership, and Islam leadership specifically Sufism and Yogi, Yogyakarta in Indonesia. Is that correct? Is that the way we say it? Yeah, yeah it's correct. <laughs> Zara aims to consider a more inclusive society with women's empowerment. She's a graduate of Dutta Wakana Christian University's Faculty of Theology. She focuses on a feminist biblical context setting the, a setting and has multiple certifications, including participation in women's empowerment in Indonesia. So welcome. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, is it my, my sounds here clear for anyone? Or Okay. Yeah. Um, I think I need to share um, my slides. Can I maybe? Um, 
share it here. Try that. Okay, let me try. Oh, sorry. I, is it working yet? Oh my God, I think it's not working. Mm. Maybe, may I get some help maybe to present the slides if I can get some help? Here with the slides, maybe. I'm sorry, waiting. Everybody can share. Or am I just try it now, Zora? Yeah. So, yeah. Basically, I just um I'm going to present to you about my community um called Sri Kandilintas Iman, which is a small community in Jakarta, but we try to commit and um, interfaith and multi-religious discussion in terms um, of sustainability in our place in Indonesia, um, especially in Jakarta. I'm sorry, is that okay if I can't present without the slides? It is perfectly fine. So okay, I'll just so, make okay. you know, let me just tell you there the name of my company is called mastery under pressure so go for it <laughs> you know? thank you ma'am tina thank you so much yeah so um just sort of introduction yeah like what ma'am tina already ma'am tina already um, tell you everyone um, my name is zera you can kindly call me zera um i am um, as i said before Part of a member of media and networking division in Sekandi Lindas Iman. Um, this community is um, focused on interreligious um, relationship between one community and other. And I basically just uh, you um, in this community having fun trying to you know um, advocate our people about this issue that sometimes um, they didn't find matter or important enough. Um, yeah, back to the um, presentations. Our my objective today for this um, presentation is to tell um, to present how this community, the Kandilindas Iman, can maintain sustainability through religions and beliefs um, in Indonesia. Um, basically, for sustainability, I will say that um, we can have a very simple definition maybe in this um aspect so we can have some same um point where we can understand this in my context um i would say the sustainability here um shows represent about a, a cure values or like um yeah work in terms of people life in society which um leads to more kind of a uh, long less impact in the society. Um, religions, I'm sorry, yeah, oh, thank you so much for the help. Um, we might, yeah, is it, we can see it clearly, Agustina, thank you so much. Um, you can, yeah, go to next slides, maybe. Okay. Yeah, to the objectives. Yeah, this is like basically what I want to explain today in this presentation. I want to tell you about how this community called Sri Kandilintas Iman Jakarta maintains the sustainability to religions and belief states in Indonesia, Southeast Asia, and globally. Yeah, next. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to state these two uh, terms so we can have same uh, ground of um, understanding. In my context in Indonesia, I want to um, show that the sustainability can um, be understood in some levels of um, life, which fulfill um, the needs of society, but also um, empowering the people inside and also the environment, which is can also be an ecological aspect, which is nature itself. 
and religions uh, play a big role in this matter, which is historically, I quoted these two sorts to show how religions and beliefs play a big role, how to shape the society and influence people behavior in some levels, um, yeah, to some um, ways of their life. Next, Augustine. Yeah. This is a very um, simple picture to um, represent how Indonesians beliefs and religions nowadays. Basically, we have two main um, foundations regarding of religions and beliefs in Indonesia, which is called um, Pancasila and Undang Undang Dasar. Basically, these two things is um, the regulations of our nations. Um, and the point is to give freedom to the people to choose and and um, believe in religion or beliefs um, in God and give, have freedom to uh, express themselves regarding their what they believe. Um, there are a lot of um, religions here, but one thing that I want to emphasize is about the um, kepercayaan, which is, Calls beliefs in Indonesia, we have this um, beliefs or understanding or way of living um, that connected to the nature, to the our origins of a country um, that we have very diverse, but there's a long history there which explains about how this um, kepercayaan has been banned before in our historically, but now it can um, appear again. It appear, sorry. It appear again, and we can't have it now. And it plays a big um, role here in our um, movement. Yeah, um, continue, maybe, please. Yeah, basically, this is the really um, big run. Sorry. Yeah. Um, this community was established on twenty nine August two thousand and fifteen. Founded by Weaving City Amina Rahmawati. This is the um, our founder of the, the founder of this community, which is also involved in this community as well, together with her. Um, in this community, we concern about violence and extremism that um, spread around the areas of Indonesia. I'm <clears throat> sorry, and um, that we re related to religions in some aspect, and it is almost always targeted the minority in society, which including women and children. And as we concern about this um, issue, we want to support the minority in society um, through their beliefs, through their own religions, to have some um, understanding, better understanding or different um, point of view of understanding um, to their religions and beliefs which is uh, not um, destroy or violence uh, to some people or some group, but can offer value and worth to people's life. Continue, please. Yep, basically this is our logo. Um, and we designed this logo inspiring by uh, the different diversity of butterflies colors and it is, um has you know connecting we connected to ecology aspect which is uh hopefully will help us to um keep um our spirit to pollination in terms of pollination which is we want to grow the justice equality and peace on this earth especially in Jakarta. next one yeah this is our our values vision and mission um, we believe that in our community, we need to um, become one. And even though we have different background, one another, especially about our um, religions and beliefs, that we need to work together as a team, as a uh, fellow human beings that need to um, empowering one another. So solidarity, dialogue, cross identity, empathy, empowering. empowering. Um, these are our five core values that um, become our foundations to strengthen our community 
um, so we can um, practice, I mean, you know, we can um, try to keep moving and do what we believe um, as our vision and mission. Um, maybe we can next, um, Agustin. Yeah, this is what I want to um, talk about um, from my community. Um, I would call this like small steps matter and it will also relate it to my, um, what I present here in the program. Um, so in Srikandil and Das Iman, we have several um, programs. This just like uh, five programs that I try to write down here just to give a big picture of how, what we have been done or what we have been doing this all times. Um, we basically try to uh, empowering from the internal of the community first because in the um, community itself, we are really like truly different in terms of the not only religious but also our geographical um, aspect which is uh, where we are came from um, so one thing that we always do is we do regular meetings and discussions or just a small um a simple uh, times together to a simple moment together to just say hi to each other and know what other people do in their life and i think in this way we also can um do what we call sustainability because i think when we can make sure that our fellows in community um keep doing well in their own life and also uh, when they are together in our community um, the well-being is also part of that what we call sustainability and other than that we also have organizing we also have program which is organizing workshops and training um, yeah networking and with these two uh, points um, basically we want to make a safe space for people and also it one we want to start it inside our community first and we will try to broaden it um, to other people and to the society. Um, as our as I mentioned in the fourth um, point here, um, this is what we try to do in terms of um, what we can contribute as a, as a community to the society. In Jakarta, we focus on um, the problems or the issues around um, women and children. We try to advocate based on interfaith um, communities, which, which means that we try to work together with our communities to sharing about what we believe, uh, what their beliefs, and we try to do dialects to um, have some real action that we can do for this kind of um, problems. Um, in Indonesia, there are a lot of kind of, um, especially in Jogja, there are a lot of kind of um, women's and children's issue related to um, sexual harassment, poverty, and so on. So as a community, we try to give a um, safe space and we try to uh, do some real actions to embrace the people there and we also educate people about this matter um so we can together um have a space have, have a safe place for people together as a um one of the society and oh the last the last point is about participating not not in their slides yet Augustine. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, basically, we have also like um, trying to um, empowering ourselves and others through um, broaden area, which is we also held some um, gathering in Southeast Asian levels, which we try to communicate what are um, the challenges among us and what can we do to help each other and in the different side we can you might can see the small steps matter that i write down here um 
we I just want to say that by I just want to say that we try to um do the safe space and the inclusivity um through a lot of ways and one of the ways that we try to do here is we um encourage all part of the society um including people um that really uh, put as a minority in our society because we have different of understanding we also have some barriers that make people um didn't understand enough about what um as inclusivity means and what is matter in terms of our love as a human being one and another so um we try to um do what we can uh, do what the what um, yeah the best action that we can do um to support this all um people together as a community um yeah we can continue on this thing yeah this i just might show you some of the challenges that i um, as a community we, ca we face um during all the movement um there are a lot of stigma stigmas that um spread around in society and also there are um, some kind of generous and gap which is um a little bit make us as a community hard to um design what kind of oppressment that um fit enough in this context which is indonesia and in jakarta especially and the one thing that become our challenges also is cultural differences and on one hand this is our um strength but on the other hand this is also um try kind of um a difficulties that we need to maintain um sort of communication so we can have better understanding on um our values um, and keep moving towards our goals. And the last point is about intolerance, which is very um, high of the number of intolerance here is very high. I would, I would say that um, and it might be one of the biggest um, challenges that we face. So till now, we're still um, processing on this. And yeah, we try to keep uh, advocate people of um, different ways of understanding of their beliefs and religions um for example about the position of um, women and men and their beliefs and religions we try to give more inclusive um, understanding so there is no discrimination towards uh, any gender there and um, it might be a long journey but we kept trying yeah um, I think there are some um, points that I can share with you now today. Um, yeah, I just want to say um, that in our community, we have this one figure named Gus Dur, which believes that um, religions or beliefs is basically um, for peace and not for violence. So I hope that um, it also become our spirit as a community and it might also um, become a good palace for you all, the participants or whoever you um, joining this event. And lastly, I want to say I'm so sorry for all the um, inconvenience here uh, about the trouble on slides and so on. But yeah, I hope that what I have been talking can be understood, can be yeah, understand well by all of you, and hopefully it can embrace at least a little tiny uh, thing for you to keep the sustainability. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Augustine. Uh, thank you so much. I think you completely nailed it, Zara. I, you know, all the problems that we have in the world your community is, you know, kind of zeroed in on. So if you have a model, <laughs> it's so wonderful to share it. So I really, I took a bunch of notes and and um, we'll, we'll kind of circle back, you know, at the end, but, but thank you so much for the work that you do. Beautiful. Thank you again. 
Okay, so our next speaker is Musa Magdalene. Musa, did I get it right? Just have to double check. Oh my goodness, you're um, you're kind of coming in and out a little bit. So perhaps kind of looking again. Yeah, let, let's let's try it. And if we have to take off your video, maybe that'll in, improve the sound, but let's try it. So let me introduce you first. Um, Musa right. is an advocate for women's inclusion. She's acquired extensive professional and leadership experience as an international development practitioner, deploying her skills as a freelance researcher and entrepreneur and a leadership development professional within nonprofit, enterprise, and social sectors. She holds a bachelor's degree from Almadu Bello University in history and a bachelor's degree and a business certification from the African Management Initiative. So welcome, Musa. I'm so delighted to have you here and uh, here you go. Thank you so much, I hope you can all hear me better now. It's not great. Try it again. Hmm. Try it again, and let's see what we can we can hear. All right. Can you all hear me? Can I? Yes. 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 All right. Thank you so much, Tina, for the introduction. Any ideas, Lewis, for her sound? No, unfortunately not. Uh, maybe maybe she can uh, try logging in again. Uh, we can we can all, of course, turn off our camera if that can maybe help her. Uh, you know, with with bandwidth, um, that that could potentially help. But I I think that she's going to log back in. Okay, okay. We'll wait just a, just a minute for her, and um, and hopefully we can hear the wonderful things that she has to say. And let's see who else is here. We have some other speakers here as well. Um, let's just give her a minute. Mm -hmm. See if she comes back on. And if we need need be, maybe we will turn off our cameras, if that'll help her. In the meantime, does anybody have any comments on Zara's talk? Oh, she's gonna come back in. Just think about it. Well, while we're waiting on Musa, I would like to say something. I thought I thought it was very impactful because one of the things that has limited discourse is religion in sustainability. Um, and to make that that connection and to develop a correlation between that um, is very visionary and forward thinking. I think one of the things that's problematic that is the dogma of religion has sustained us to the point that we have lacked the attachment of religion to spirituality and that it is an individual's choice and position to position themselves in that position. And uh, what our Zara did was, was a very unique way of explaining how a community was able to utilize a platform of religion to help create emancipatory practices. And isn't that what we're all doing? We're trying to sustain emancipatory practice, how to emancipate ourselves from the isms, from the intersectionalities of those isms and how to remove ourselves from them that we could be a free entity. And so I really appreciated that conversation. That's something I'm gonna look into more in reference to embracing that discourse. We have to remove ourselves from the mental slaveries 
in order for us to be emancipatory people, to connect collectively, to emancipate each other. That's my thoughts on it. Thank you. Well, <laughs> that was a great way of putting it all together. Because yes, religion can be and is, as we see in our world, so divisive. And um, but the great religions of the world are not. It's what we've <laughs> what we've extrapolated to our own personal egos and um, you know ideas that, that what we want to put forward. So thank you again. So let's try it again, Mag uh, Messa. Okay. Yes, Tina. Hello, everyone. Once again, much can you all hear me? Much better. Yeah, much better. Much great. better. There you go. All right, thank you. I apologize. I am currently in Katsina. It's um, a state that has been experiencing a whole lot of insurgency. So sometimes because of um, um, uh, military activities, they usually shut down the networks. So we usually have glitches like that. So I apologize for uh, my um, network. So um, thank you so much for the introduction once again, Martina. Um, good to see you after the last time. You look radiant always. Um, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Magdalene Musa. I am uh, a Nigerian, and I'm honored to be here to speak about uh, something that relates well with, with me. Because I will say I have, I suffered from not knowing my purpose for a long time, and it not only affected me personally but also my organization. And um, I think that was why I chose um, discovering purpose you know, as a topic, because I have seen and I've witnessed quite a number of organization uh, in the community I am that started and along the line, you know, they're no longer existing or uh, they stopped functioning uh, because um, they started with a different, uh, uh, should I say a different thinking. Uh, it's unfortunate that from where I come from, quite a number of people just feel um, just doing feel good activities is enough to uh, in, you know bring impact in our community. But over time, I'm happy that organizations are thinking sustainability. And the question I keep asking is, how can you come up with sustainable uh, you know projects if you do not even understand your purpose as an organization or your purpose as an individual? And uh, um, I remember sharing uh, my story saying when I started my nonprofit, I didn't know I was starting a nonprofit. For me, I was just giving back because there was a need. Um, a community in Plateau State was um, attacked and there were so many people that were displaced. There was a need and I just sprung up and started giving back. And along the line, you know, getting feedbacks from this um, displaced persons, I realized that there was so much to be done. Young girls were being married off because their parents, either they lost their parents or their parents could not support them anymore in school. Uh, you know, a whole lot of issues kept on springing up from this camp. And I was like, okay, we really need to do something. But I struggled for a while because I was doing everything at the same time. I didn't really sit down to say, okay, which of these problems resonates more with me? Which of these problems do I have experience in? And you know, how can I really profess sustainable solutions so that when I leave these communities, um, they won't still be dependent on someone to come, right? They can really sustain themselves or keep doing or keep surviving without uh, getting support from me or any other organization. And with help from mentors, I was able to sit down and say, first, I have been displaced myself. The issue of um, period poverty, I have experienced, experienced period poverty and it was something that um, these women and girls experienced in the camps. And you know, I had to go learn how to make reusable parts and I had to teach other young women in my communities that were interested in giving back the skills so that we can teach um, these women. And, you know, it went beyond that because we had to start doing, uh, you know, should I call it, we teach these women in camps and ask them to teach other women so that the skill will continue even while uh, we had left the camp. So um, I am, I keep, telling people, especially young um, people coming up who are thirsty 
to give back to their communities who have a dream, who have the, you know, the desire to do something. I keep saying, identify your purpose first. If not, you will waste time, you'll waste resources. Um, you will also risk yourself and expose yourself to things because I remember when I started, um, you know, it's it's the security here in Nigeria is very fragile. So you can you can be tagged as someone that has so much money if you don't have it. And imagine being kidnapped, thinking you have so much money, and then people realizing that you don't even have a sense to your name. So um, that's just like you know uh, um, a joke. But the idea is, I encourage that young people who have the desire to give back in their communities should take the time to discover what it is that resonates with them, to understand what it is that they know how to do best, because. Um, living your legacy behind should be what you will be remembered for. And you cannot leave a legacy behind if you don't leave something that is sustainable, if you don't need something that can survive for a very long time. So um, once you are able to understand your purpose and the purpose of your organization, it goes a long way to help you understand how to design your programs, how to look out for partnerships, what grants to look out for, um, what kind of um, projects to design and implement, and the people that actually need it. Because unfortunately, there are so many uh, nonprofits here that just go into um, a community without actually taking you know, needs assessment to know if these people actually need this intervention, if these people need this project or not, they just go into a community. And then at the end of the day, impact is not made. They go back feeling fulfilled without actually, you know, making the desired impact like they should. So um, I, I, I believe uh, I was given 15 minutes to talk, right? <laughs> I don't want to talk too much. Mm -hmm. No, you you are my what's fabulous things. Keep going, Magdalene. Keep going. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Tina. All right. So um I, I, I want to call to um older generation like Tina and and the rest that are here to really um you know, come up with ways to mentor younger generations like myself, because I I would say I it took me a long time to discover. Uh, myself because I didn't really have people in my community to look out for or to look up to because I come from northern Nigeria where I'm, at my age I'm I will be 38 October at my age I'm supposed to be a grandma with maybe some grandchildren going around because girls get married very early and they're not you know highest maybe if you're fortunate enough your parents allow you to go to secondary school and then you're pushed to go get married. You're not, you're not expected to have dreams or want to do stuff. Um, so it was really difficult for me to navigate myself because I didn't really have women around me to say, hey, I want to do this. How do I go around about doing this? Or what do I do? What skill do I need to get? Um, what courses do I need to learn or, you know, take to build my capacity to be able to, you know, do so much. And uh, until I was able to, you know, ironically, most of my mentors were not even from my region. I had to get mentors outside my region, people who were willing to support. And, you know, within a year plus, I, I did so much that I was like, okay, now I really understand the importance of any young person that really has you know, the desire to make impact, you know, to have a mentor, someone that has walked that path to, you know, show you what to do, how to do it, because um, yes, I understand the context might change, but the problems are the same, um, you know, and I believe um, with someone who actually knows how to do this, it will save you time to reach you know, the destination faster and easier than you trying to discover your path alone. And so I want to call on older generations to really, you know, be available. I know life can be tricky, everyone is busy, but I know there are young people that are willing to, you know, avail themselves to want to be mentored. Uh, young people who maybe they really, they, okay, they have identified what they're passionate about. They have discovered this is who they are and who they want to be or what they want to do, but they have no idea of the map, 
you know how to draw this map on how to do this um and also i really will encourage um partnerships you know i uh, starting was really difficult because you know getting bigger uh, other organizations to partner knowing that oh you're just a young lady trying to do your thing you haven't really gotten much funds from anywhere how can i trust you but um you know they don't really look back and say okay let's see what you've done with what you had you know let's see how many how much impact you've been able to make with the little you had right so uh, i'll encourage that you know women um that are doing stuff i i start talking to women because i feel we really have a lot of grounds to conquer and we can only do that if we support each other across boards um across continents and um you know um support ourselves and encourage ourselves um, i was so excited about this platform because um last year i was able to take part in the work in nigeria and yes, the work uh, for silence. And I, I remember meeting some women because we did our work in a market. And I remember some women, how emotional they were when um, when they saw us walking. And I remember someone asking me, oh, what is this about? And when I spoke about it and I told her, this work is not just in Nigeria, it's across the world. And you know, she was like, can I hold your placard and walk with you? You know, the, the she felt she was going to be part of something. And it made me realize how there are people out there who really want to do something, but because they do not know how to do it or how to go about it, it will be nice if this platform is uh, made um, available for people out there to have access to have access to people on this ground, this this environment, this moment, to learn from them what they from their success stories, um, their mistakes of me, so that they can do better than you know, they could ever imagine. So I think um I'll stop here and once again I'm really honored to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. Beautiful. How you have really, really, again, nailed it. Um, I have to say, Loretta, you really have <laughs> found speakers for us that really speak the truth. So many things, um, Magdalene, that you identified. What I love is there's a lot of people who love to give, and, and you're absolutely right. People give, 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 and then they get burnt out, and then it doesn't last. But your idea of finding your purpose first is brilliant and probably contradictory to many cultures where women have really been uh, kind of under the thumb. And so, again, so many more things to talk about. Uh, your call to action, asking for mentors. Um, WOCCN has, that's the jazzy jazz. That's exactly what Loretta has started. So there's a whole community, an international community um, of people who want, want help, young women who want help and the mentors that are there. So again, we could go on and on, but we do have another wonderful speaker who is here. And this is our first uh, gentleman of the day. And I do wanna say one thing, um, you know, Zara and, and Magdalene, you, you ran up against things that were out of your control, like the slides and the no apologies necessary. One of the things that women do many times is we always say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but we're sorry for things that we, we haven't done. So I used, to, I used to collect quarters from women. Every time they said they're sorry for something that they had nothing, no control over, I, I, I said, I'm going to get rich. So just a little notice. You both um, kind of came back on and we're just fabulous. So our next speaker, Dr. Roger Aklar. And Dr. Aklar, or Robert, not Roger, Robert, he's a general manager at an energy service company and founder of the world's largest environmental and energy network, Sustainability Energy and Environmental Awards Judge. He's an engineer, a social scientist with academic credentials from esteemed institutions such as Harvard, Leicester, I know that's an English thing, and Cranfield. <laughs> His interests revolve around social science research's role in understanding and addressing the challenges 
and impacts of renewable and efficient energy systems, sustainable energy transition, and climate change. We welcome you so much, Dr. Rob Robert Eckhart. The floor is yours. It's Roger. It's Roger. Thank you. It, oh, um, oh, oh, I have it in two different ways here. Yes, Roger. It's okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, distinguished guests, uh, staff of women and cons of concerned professionals, and fellow participants, it is with great pleasure that I address you today during this GSP summit. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to the women of concerned professionals for bestowing upon me the Legacy Award. Thank you all for this wonderful opportunity. I would like to speak in the next few minutes about the vital role that women play in environmental preservation, safeguarding nature and biodiversity, and contributing to our sustainable future. Additionally, I want to commend women of concerned professionals for their efforts in supporting sustainable practices and projects, emphasizing environmental consciousness and social economic stability. Women play a crucial role in managing natural resources within their families and communities. They are often responsible for tasks related to water collection, fuel sources, food cultivation, forest management, and agricultural activities. In developing countries, women contribute significantly to food production. Estimates suggest that they produce 60 to 80% of the food consumed in these regions. Their involvement spans various stages, from planting and tending crops to harvesting and processing food. Women's intimate knowledge of local ecosystems and their close connection to the land enable them to adopt sustainable practices. They understand the delicate balance between resource utilization and preservation. Recognizing and supporting women's roles in resource management and food production is essential for achieving gender equity and sustainable development. Empowered women contribute not only to their families' well being, but also to broader community resilience. In terms of workload and vulnerability, Women's workload often centers around managing natural resources, such as water, fuel, and food. Unfortunately, this places them at particular risk when environmental conditions shift. For instance, changes in weather patterns, deforestation, or water scarcity directly impact their daily lives and well being. Women's experiences and perspectives are also invaluable for sustainable development policy making. The first-hand knowledge of resource availability, climate challenges, and community needs informs effective strategies. Inclusion of women's voices ensures more holistic and resilient policies. As for climate adaptation, women's engagement is crucial. Actively seek remedies and innovative solutions to cope with environmental shifts, whether it's implementing drought-resistant farming techniques or advocating for community-based conservation, their actions contribute significantly. I would also like to delve into the significance of women's voices and perspectives in the context of sustainable development, drawing inspiration from pivotal moments in history. The first thing to remember is the 1992 UN Earth Summit, the Rio Summit. The United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, UNCED, held in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, emphasized the importance of gender equality in environmental decision-making. Women's participation was recognized as essential for achieving sustainable development goals. Their unique insights and experiences were acknowledged as critical assets. Another initiative that is worth mentioning is the India's Tipco movement that originated in the 1970s in India and was led predominantly by women. Women hug trees to prevent deforestation, highlighting their deep connection to the environment and their role as environmental stewards. Their activism raised awareness about the need for sustainable forestry practices and community-based conservation. The third initiative I would like to highlight is Kenya's Green Belt Movement. Founded by Nobel laureate Wangari Matai, the Green Belt Movement empowered women to plant trees across Kenya. By involving women in reforestation efforts, the movement addressed environmental degradation, poverty, and women's empowerment simultaneously. 
demonstrated that women's leadership and environmental action go hand in hand. Remarkable initiatives are breaking down gender barriers, exemplified by the Barefoot College's training program for women in solar engineering. The Barefoot College, located in Rajasthan, India, trains illiterate women from poor villages worldwide. These women, known as solar mamas, undergo six months of intensive training in solar technology installation and maintenance. Benefits go beyond energy. Solar electrification not only provides light, but also reduces indoor pollution. Families benefit from lower lighting costs, improved health, and enhanced quality of life. The initiative challenges gender norms by empowering women to become solar engineers. They learn to assemble, install, and maintain solar panels and equipment, breaking down traditional barriers. In summary, women are critical agents of environmental conservation, sustainable development, and climate adaptation. Women's contributions to natural resource management and food security are invaluable. Their expertise, dedication, and sustainable practices are vital for a healthier planet and thriving communities. Recognizing women's roles, vulnerabilities, and contributions is essential for building a sustainable future. Their resilience and adaptability are key assets in addressing environmental challenges. Women's active participation perspectives and advocacy are vital for achieving sustainable development. Their contributions shape policies, foster resilience, and promote a healthier planet for all. Initiatives like the Barefoot College empower women, promote renewable energy, and create positive ripple effects in rural areas. In conclusion, I sincerely appreciate the invitation to this remarkable GSP Summit. Let's maintain our collaboration, inspiration, and commitment to positive change. Heartfelt thanks to the women of concerned professionals for creating platforms that empower women to, to thrive, connect, and make a positive impact in their communities. I'm also truly grateful for this award. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> How many men spend as much time researching about what women have done? <laughs> that was remarkable. Thank you so much because we are different. <laughs> And together we do different different aspects of, of life and, and the world. And um, to have to be recognized for you know is is really um, a pleasure. Thank you again. And uh, I'm sure as as the comments go on, you will hear more. Uh, we need more men like you who appreciate our sex and the same women who appreciate men like you. So that will bring us together. Wonderful. Okay, so our next speaker is a student, uh, Sayafa Nandita Defa Naranti. Did I say it right? She's going to take herself off mute. Sayafa, where are you? There you are. You're still on mute. Let's see if we can. Lewis, maybe we can take her off mute. Here we go. No, not yet. Can we do that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. I'm so sorry because my connection is a little bit of lagging. No apology. No apologies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Thank you so much. All right, wait a second. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so let me introduce you a little bit more. Okay? Oh, okay. That's right. I forgot. <laughs> a fourth year student at the International Relations Department of, I can hardly say this, Sayarif, I'm going to let you say it, Is blank, Islamic State University, <laughs> whose concerns are about international social issues, focusing on children, gender equality, and quality education. So welcome, Sayafa. So glad to have you here. Thank you so much, Dina. So glad to have you guys in this room as well. So hello, guys. Greetings from Indonesia. I'm Shafa, and currently I'm the last semester student uh, from Islamic State of Sharif Hidayatullah Jakarta. And mm -hmm. my major is international relations. And yeah, currently I'm still in Indonesia and actually um it's already midnight in here but it's a wonderful and exciting experience to have a discussion with you guys 
And but first thing first, I would like to also, you know, greetings. So actually, I also share about this, uh, you know, this discussion program through my social media, especially through my Instagram. And also I invited people to come here. And there's some of my friends in here, which is Nashua and also Mima. Hi, Nashua Mima. Thank you so much for joining this discussion. And yes, so um, I'm going to talk about the international relationship within sustainability. So yeah, uh, since my major is international relations, so some of the people uh, think about international relations major, they think it is the same as the international corporations like in, um, you know, like in corporate, like in company, or like just casual international relationship with people. But basically international relations in major is we talk about the relations across nations, relations across boundaries and what we and the concern that we put in our major is the world issues. So yeah, that's why I'm choosing this um this theme especially. And a little bit about me, this little bit uh, introduction about me will be related to what I'm going to talk about. So I've associated myself into um a community social development. The three three of them is um called international based and one of them is local based so the first one is isaac so mima and also nashua my friend is also associated with isaac so probably if you guys um familiar with isaac it is also um grow in a lot of in university or or a lot of regions across the world and we have been you know we have been developed since 1948 so yeah it's already been like more than 70 years, ISAC itself. And ISAC is actually an international youth-run organization that we're focusing uh, on the leadership development. And my second organization is ASEAN Youth Organization. And a, a little bit fun fact about this, I met Agustina, the, the VP of this project is from this organization, this ASEAN Youth Organization during our conferences. And this organization is actually aimed to enable youth with a high end interest on ASEAN to create a positive, sustainable change. And also I have this, um, the third one is International Humanity Foundation is a not-for-profit organization that focusing on develop, developing child, but especially the child with, you know, underprivileged child, the, um, uh, the impoverished child, and we support them with, you know, financial support and talent, um, talent development, etc. And the last one is the local one, but for me is the most, you know, the most unique one and the most, um, um, one of the memorial memorial one lah. Uh, it's called Girl Up Jakarta. So this organization is focusing on gender equality and also um, inclusivity. And by this four um organizations, some of you probably might think um uh, something that across your mind probably oh yeah this is the international organization international exposure there are a lot of networking etc. But what I'm going to emphasize is actually. The similarities between these organizations is about the youth itself. So what I'm going to tell to talk about to you guys is the important role of youth. So <clears throat> all of the organizations that that are associated with me has the same vision and has the same you know the same beliefs with me that youth is the fundamental key to create a better future because its intention, which is the youth intentions, is still genuine. So I have this discussion with my senior in work, and he even, you know, he even can, he he even barely um, handle our enthusiastic, because youth is always associated with with our enthusiasm, with our, you know, with our, our aggress aggressivity, etc. But yeah, that's what makes us have a genuine um, interest to to develop the future, to create a better world, etc. Because we don't really put much pressure on creating profit or creating revenue. So yeah, that's why um, this organization always believe that youth is a fundamental key, and we always put youth to have a you know big role in um, creating our project, etc. And also um, having a cooperations with government, especially Indonesia, we we tend to always connecting ourselves to government in um, in the region because Indonesia we 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 are really decentralized, and from that decentralization is also born a lot of you know civil society and we trying to always connecting with the civil society across the uh, across the regions in indonesia 
And however, if we take a look at this data in ASEAN, which is in um in Southeast Asia, um unfortunately the participation and also the engagement rate is quite low. It's only 57.7%. So the people in <clears throat> ASEAN, uh they um some most of them who, who joined the volunteering project who creating framework of a national policy etc is coming from urban area not from rural area and it's really hard to you know reach out the rural area etc and also the equity and also the inclusion rate um, of youth in ASEAN is also only 60.6%. And again, <clears throat> it's also because of the limitations of opportunities and also the facilities. <clears throat> so, for example, the inclusion that we talk about is also from the, you know, the, um, for people with disabilities and also um, most of the Southeast Asian country is not really, um, you know, re not really friendly with the LGBTQ community, etc. And they tend to be discriminated and they tend to be marginalized in Southeast Asia. That's why um, the, the rate of this equity and inclusion is really low. And sadly, it also happened with the, you know, the mindset with the youth itself, like that. And, um, but in the other side, in ASEAN itself, we have, uh, what we called as ASEAN Community Community Vision 2025. And we're trying to achieve it by 2025, which is next year. By the next year, we uh, we need to, you know, um, engage more youth to participate in policy discourse, in, vol in volunteering activities, in creating innovative solutions, etc. But yeah, it's it's already, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be almost a year uh, before us really reach these, this ASEAN Community Vision 2025. So we have a really short time, but our homework is still a lot like that. And this ASEAN Community Vision is also the um, the support for the SDGs 2020, uh, 2030. And uh, yeah, as a person who always trying to associate it myself to participate as a, you know, the, the change of ASEAN and also trying to participate myself as the, you know, ASEANer, um, this is the impact that, uh, that I experiences during my international youth engagement with the society. So the first one is investment in skills, educations, and capabilities. So since we still have a youthful energy, what we think the most is to unleash the better potential uh, within ourselves. So I'm going to quote the um, um, Musa sessions before. Um, she said that um, if we want to develop the non-profit organization, we need to know first about uh, what we're trying to pursue and also the passions for of each individuals. And in international organizations like this, like the like my organizations, we're focusing first, obviously, uh, uh, to unleash the best potentials within ourselves. Um, after that, we can talk about world. After that, we can talk. We can, um, you know, we can give best for our surround, etc. And then the second one is during the engagement for uh with within the international organization is being more connected and global minded so there there's this uh one of experience um with me and also with agustina so with uh, in our conferences in our conferences in asean um we are you know we are expected to create a project and the project there is quite you know quite high have a really heavy theme which is um about radicalism, about terrorism, etc. And it and it's quite um weight. But because we are connecting, there's also delegates from Europe, there's also de delegates from American, they they also share their, you know, their experiences in their country. And we really doing an exchange and discussion. How how do we apply applicate it into our project discussion? And also the last one is always share the innovative ideas and also promote cross-cultural understanding. So um, 
Um, so I'm going to talk about the international organizations that I've associated with. So I've been in these organizations for about three years. And my latest experience in this organization is as a president of ISEC in uh, UIN Jakarta, not ISEC in Indonesia or ISEC in the world, obviously. It's too it's too big for me. But yeah, uh, this um, what is the most unique thing about this ISEC? or this international uh, youth leadership organizations is we provide youth to always be in their top leadership potential. So we always um, put mindset and always we always brainwash this lot of young people that they are leader for their own. So uh, after they always uh, after they have a mindset that they are a leader of their own, then they can lead people. Then they can lead a more uh, a bigger audience, etc. And how we do that is basically by doing a practical experiences, practical experiences through challenging environment. So what we provided to them is um, our exchange um, program, like global volunteer, and then there's also global teacher. We enable them to to teach um, to teach to uh, to teach to people, to kids, etc. But, but abroad they are going abroad, and also global internship, and then also there's a several projects, uh, a local projects, and um in 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 each countries. So, Mima, Mima, my friends, he she's also associated with local projects in ISAC. And what is really the most unique thing about local project itself, because um they can really you know um they can really uncover things that probably not really not really interesting to talk about in Indonesia for example when we talk about um uh, when we talk about a uh, health and uh, health and well-being probably the trend is about mental etc but Mima and his uh, and her team they uh they talk about a um a health and well-being from the other side so they're trying to you know, to to engage a um, I'm sorry, I forget the name, like the mental mental recovery um mental recovery institution. So they engage a mental recovery institutions to their program, and they also engage a South Tangram, which is ACT Indonesia, to also contribute to this project. So yeah, what I'm trying to say is, this organizations is not only um you know basically just doing doing a project a project a project or only thinking about ourselves 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 but we're trying to balance both of them like that and that's what makes it really challenging but what what makes it really um you know what makes it really um reach out the best potentials within ourselves within the youth that are associated within these organizations and in Isaac itself we already have more than 3 a hundred and thousand people or youth are developed through exchange experiences. <clears throat> so yeah, as what I'm talking about, we collaborate with many stakeholders and um, what we're trying to support is also sustainable development goals like that. And actually, you can find a lot of ISAC alumni on top of um, professionals board or positions. Um, like, yeah, a, a lot, like most of the top of MNC, etc. Most of them is also um they are originally from Isaac alumni, and why it can happen because the you know the we also exposed with a with a intern uh, with a professional things with a huge professional mindset with a leadership capacity and we also trying to be trained to well skilled in several positions, um in you know in professional area like that. And then we also have ASEAN Youth Organizations. So basically, we have four uh, pillars program, which is ASEAN Ambassador Program, ASEAN Youth Digital Forum, ASEAN Youth Exchange, and also ASEAN Youth Economic Forum. And this four program is basically based on the four pillars of the ASEAN itself, which is the social socioeconomic pillars and also um, um, inclusivity pillars, education pillars, etc. And then the last, uh, and then the third one, we have International Humanity Foundation. So these organizations, um, the the unique things uh, of these organizations, most of the office or most of the focus of the program is based in Indonesia. 
but the developer of this international human foundation is actually originally from new york so yeah she's not from indonesia but she really have a you know deep connections with some things going on in indonesia <clears throat> so yeah they trying we trying to connect youth volunteers across Indonesia and also in Kenya and also in Thailand, and we're trying to develop education and contribute to life support or marginalized, um or unprivileged kids. We also provide like a safe home. <clears throat> we also create like a livestock. So we we created like a small business, um of a livestock and the result of the livestock itself will be donated into this um these kids these children. And the last one is Girl Up. So this Girl Up um, Jakarta is create, um, is created to exploring gender equality issues through the world. And we also build a leadership core skills because um, especially as what I mentioned in Southeast Asia, the rate of child marriage, the rate of, you know, um, marginalized women and the rate of discriminated women especially in rural area is very very high that's why we think that if we create a core skill especially like a leadership or any kind of talent any kind of talent that are suit with them it's going to um mark up their value therefore um it will help us to decreasing the rate of child marriage it will decreasing the rate of um the harassment through women um uh, yeah yeah, especially like the, the discrimination through women and also to through child like that. And these are the challenge, especially especially the challenge that we encounter in ASEAN. So um we still really hard to gather more inclusive representative from all of our ASEAN countries. So from what I know, as uh, after I discuss with um youth from um European Union or, or from like American Union. I think um, they have a really strong connection between the youth um, in their region. But in ASEAN, I think um, it's still lower. It's still a small amount of um, small, small amount of platform that can connect us. So yeah, I just know ASEAN. I, I just know ASEAN Youth Organization. And then I just know like um, several non not-for-profit organizations that connect us. So, um, and then the second one is um, I think the government in Southeast Asia, they they just think youth youth um as person that doesn't really capable to support their project. So they they try they always see us for granted. They always take us for granted, and they don't really um open opportunities for us to to take ownership to <clears throat> to take ownership to make our project sustainable. So basically, our project that we proposed to the government is just seasonal and they don't take it sustainable but if they really support us um i really really believe that it could be really sustainable for example the the project that i talked about before about the local project that focusing on a health and well-being we engage government as well and <clears throat> the government is really supporting us that's why the the project is still sustainable until now and even we could we can make like revenue from it and the revenue that we gain from our project, um, it could it could boost the sustainability of our organizations as well, like that. And then also the lack of synergy between cross field community, for example, education community only focusing on education, um, and then gender equality community only focusing on gender equality. But rarely we trying to you know merge what um the strength of education community, the strength of gender equality community um and we we collaborate to each other it's uh, it's quite rare in here and only those who can speak in english has higher chance to engage international community so yeah basically because the mother language of southeast asian country is um most of them is not english me me as well my mother language is not english and sometimes it's quite hinder us um to you know to connect with people especially to to only like speaking to only having a discussion like in this forum it's quite be it's quite being a struggle for us who cannot really speak in english and then the last one is don't really have a specific vision or kpi to be achieved in terms of youth engagement in and contribution and i think the key core solutions about it is we need to learn more and benchmark more from EU youths and also US youth. So I um I just know that 
uh, European Union um, youth, they have their own um, consistent discussion platform like every month, monthly, even weekly. And I think it's it's going to be great if it also happened in Southeast Asia. And also government from all respective, respective countries should provide working plan of youth engagement and contribution. Because I think um, the youth engagement and contribution is only created by the ASEAN organizations itself, not by the government from the respective countries. And then also we can create more consistent monthly discussions as what I've mentioned before. And to talk about the sustainable tra uh, trans issues in the regions, cross nationals, and then um, reach out youth more in rural areas. So from what I um, um, from what I know from my experience, some of the members as well in in international organizations, they quite think they themselves as exclusive. So it's quite rare for them to invite there uh, is to invite people from rural areas to learn from them to be to mentoring them to to increasing their values it's quite rare it's quite rare because some of them think that um they're exclusive if they're associated with international organizations meanwhile we need to achieve this you know more inclusive kpi right and then the last one is proposed to government to make cross national project are massively integrated or ad adopted in schools and university. So basically, um, um, mostly the, the the project that are running in each country is just like a, a local project. But we need a more cross national project that are also integrated and adopted in the schools and also in the university. For example, like the global volunteer that Isaac has. It is already adopted uh, and integrated in schools and university, and it's well known. That's why um we can engage and we can yeah we can engage a lot of youth, and yeah it really give um a really big big differences for their life um for their um for their development life journey. And the last word for me, I think cross-cultural understanding is encompasses an understanding of different nations or territories, races, ethnicities, religions, as well as across and different sectors and segments of society. So I think it really, really should be our main priority because it triggers like a strong solidarity and also a teamwork to change the future. I think that's pretty much about me. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for listening to my sessions. I'm going to back to Tina. Wow. Well, I don't know about you folks, but I'm pretty inspired. <laughs> um, again, who Loretta has kind of identified from this international community are you young visionaries? You need us as mentors, and we need you. <laughs> because you are really the beholders of, you know, when we're gone for our children and our grandchildren. And so um, what I love about this conference, and I've said it every year that I've been here, not only do you bring out the problems and the challenges, but you have solutions. And um, hopefully we, we will get this out Lewis, to as many people as possible because um, these young women are brilliant and really kind of you are our future and we uh, we encourage you <laughs> to keep going <laughs> and keep growing and keep asking for help and um, again it's our responsibility as the older generation to support you so thank you again okay so we do have our first speaker who also was apologizing because of some technical <laughs> uh, difficulties and I uh, Giti, you laugh. I, no apologies necessary. <laughs> that wasn't in your control. So please, uh, let's see, where is Gita? Come say hello and, and bring yourself on camera if you will. There you are. Okay, so Dr. Gita is an interdisciplinary researcher whose interests include socio-ecological aspects of conserving aquatic ecosystems and coastal zones. Since aquatic ecosystems are under threat, Due to climate change, Dr. Gita believes that aquatic conservation is important to protect biodiversity and water for future generations, as water is essential to our life's survival. So welcome, and the floor is yours. 
thank you so much tina for your uh, invitation and welcome and uh, hello to all actually i was uh, late to join due to some heavy rain here my internet connection was interrupted and luckily i got uh, the connection now and i joined with all of you here today and uh, today i wish to um, talk about uh, related with the topic related with the uh, freshwater ecosystems and marine ecosystems yeah and uh, i am uh, dr geeta plakal and uh, i am an early career marine scientist from kerala india and i am very passionate about the uh, marine and environmental conservation and the protection of biodiversity and the uh, sustainable uh, blue economy and uh, organic farming everything you know related with these uh, subjects i am working on these uh, topics and uh, um, i am very glad to join with all of you and uh, uh, i heard some of your talks and also um, thank you so much again for lorita and everyone thank you and i think uh, let's uh, start our slide now can you see my slides now beautifully yes okay thank you thank you and today i'm talking about the conservation of aquatic ecosystems uh, for a sustainable future and uh, water is essential for survival of life on earth the air we breathe the water we drink and the food we get from the land lakes rivers and oceans are all dependent on healthy freshwater ecosystems and the aquatic ecosystems are vital to sustainable water resource management and are recognized as a key part of sdg 6 or sustainable development goal 6 the national plan for conservation of aquatic ecosystems was launched in 2013 to help conserve and restore wetlands and the improve water quality and promote biodiversity in global uh, level and also water and our future according to the various research sources predictions for the future of water for our global civilization are bleak approximately 6 billion people will face the water scarcity by 2050 due to increasing demand from population growth and changing consumption patterns rising pollution levels and most importantly reduced or unpredictable water availability as a result of more severe climate impacts these overlapping and compounding risks could cost some regions up to 6% of their gdp and even spark mass migration and conflicts between a uh, society or community people or by the global level or something like that nations between nations etc and freshwater ecosystems and threats freshwater cover uh, less than 1 percentage of earth's uh, surface with over 60% of this being permanent water bodies and the remaining being seasonally intermittent and despite their rather marginal representation of the earth's surface fresh waters are home to approximately 10% of all described species of fungi plants invertebrates and vertebrates on earth and the relative contribution of fresh water ecosystems to global biodiversity is thus extremely high as a flagship and well studied example species of bony fishes that is inhabiting in rivers and lakes and are as numerous as the ones inhabiting the seas and the current major threats to freshwater biodiversity include climate change habitat modification and pollution from land use habitat fragmentation and the flow regime homogenization by dams non native species or invasive species water abstraction for industry or irrigation and mining and over exploitation of natural populations reviewed in a carpenter et al 2021 uh, and they are reported like that and those threats and their interactions currently affect freshwater biodiversity and the functioning to varying degrees and climate is one of the primary driver underlying patterns of biodiversity on earth indirectly acting on dispersal speciation and extinction processes through water energy dynamics and climate and biodiversity are so closely tied 
that it is not a real surprise that distributions of our species are changing, accelerating rates with the human-driven climate change. Scientific evidence is accumulating that many freshwater aquatic species are responding to warming by elevational and or northward shifts in their distribution ranges. That means they are migrating from one place to another based on this ocean warming or water temperature, higher water temperature, and they're tracking, tracking climate warming velocity. And however, there is also evidence that the species range shifts are uh, idiosyncratic and habitat dependent. And these differential species responses to warming promote and will continue to promote reshuffling of communities and consequent cascading effects on food webs uh, in our aquatic ecosystems and ecosystem functioning and that affecting regional availability of food for humans, particularly in developing countries. And decreased water availability and altered flow regimes reduce habitat size and heterogeneity. This increases population extinction rates because the probability of species extinctions increases with reduced habitats. That means the place uh, that living for that uh, something, uh, some organisms are not uh, usable or uh, they have no availability of such habitats so that the species will uh, extinct. And the marine biodiversity is vital to life in our ocean. Marine biodiversity is the variety of life in our ocean. It includes all animals, plants, and microorganisms living in our ocean, from barnacles to whales to coral reefs. The term is also used to describe the abundance of species living in an area. Some places have such a large variety of different and rare species that they are referred to as biological hotspots that support important biological processes such as spawning, nurseries, or feeding areas for marine organisms. And the marine biodiversity allows nature in our ocean to be protective, resilient, and adaptable to environmental change. Marine biodiversity can prevent one species extinction from causing wider negative impacts on a marine ecosystem. And we say an ecological system is resilient if it keeps functioning even when the population of a species declines or a species becomes extinct. A functioning ecosystem means the natural processes are working effectively, including those providing goods and services to humans, such as storing carbon or filtering water. Each species in the ocean has a particular role to play, whether that is marine worms converting organic material into carbon dioxide from marine plants to photosynthesis or sharks controlling prey populations. Some species play similar roles in an ecosystem. So if one species becomes extinct, another will be able to carry out the same function or services. Threats of marine ecosystem. Fishing has had the greatest impact on marine biodiversity in the last 50 years. Some species are unique in function and their extinction would represent the loss of millions of years of evolution. For example, the large toothed sawfish is the most evolutionally distinct and globally endangered rayfish globally that is targeted by the wildlife trade and vulnerable to bycatch uh, during fishing activities. And major risks to marine biodiversity include overfishing, bycatch, climate change, pollution, invasive species, other human-related impacts. Marine ecosystem and climate change and global sea levels are rising as a result of human caused global warming. The recent rates being unprecedented over the 20, uh, 2500 plus year. Then uh, sea level rise is caused primarily by two factors related to global warming. The added water from melting ice sheets and glaciers and the expansion of seawater as it warms. And some studies are showing that ocean acidification can modify the abundance and chemical composition of harmful algal blooms in such a way that shellfish toxicity increases and therefore human health is negatively affected. Coral reefs are also vulnerable to ocean acidification and ocean warming. Uh, next is climate change can cause sea level rise and changes in the frequency of intensity and the distribution of tropical storms and altered ocean circulation. And uh, this will uh, lead to the, uh, uh, let's affect uh, the human populations and also in uh, biodiversity on land 
and the uh, coastal regions. The climate change impacts may lead to biodiversity loss and atrophic system collapse in marine environment. Marine dead zone begin to form when excess nutrients from farmlands and uh, terrestrial ecosystems reach into the ocean that uh, leads to primary nitrogen and phosphorus increases and enter coastal waters and help fertilize blooms or poisonous blooms or algae formation. And such areas will be... Uh, um, not inhabited, uh, not habitable for the organisms that live in that uh, marine environment, and that becomes the marine, marine dead zone formation in that area. And plastic pollution in marine ecosystem, an estimated 1.13 to 2.24 billion metric tons of that waste is leaked into the ocean and the environment every year. And uh, we uh, know that many uh, consequences from the plastic pollutions that affected our health, that means the human health and also the other organisms on the marine environment. And 100 million marine mammals die each year from plastic waste alone. And uh, one lakhs marine mammals, animals die from getting entangled in plastic yearly. And uh, one in a three marine mammal species get found entangled in litter. And uh, 12 to 14,000 tons of plastics are integrated by North Pacific fish yearly. Uh, by 2050, the pollution of fish will be accumulate, uh, outnumbered by our dumped plastic. And solutions to protect marine biodiversity. Choose sustainable seafood. The top action recommended by the Biodiversity Council is to look for the MSE blue fish stick label on seafood products and use less plastic. Be mindful about a single-use plastic and the recycle. From schemes like Recycle Smart to local council pickups and reduce your carbon footprint from cutting down on red meat to switching to renewable electricity and pick up litter at the beach. Just a little each time can make a difference. Support sustainable fishing practice. You can donate to the MZ and to support uh, uh, something like that, such organizations to mission ending to overfishing. Promote ocean literacy. Encourage your local school to use uh, our free ocean themed learning uh, processes use, uh, using uh, to promote the ocean literacy in school children. And the sustainable fisheries use innovative technologies and creative fishing practices to protect biodiversity. Signed it, fishers, uh, students and NGOs work together to develop sustainable fishing practices worldwide because they can transform marine environments when they collaborate for a common cause. And what is the importance of aquatic ecosystems and biodiversity? Aquatic organisms, that uh, uh, we can see them from bacteria and fungi to the big marine mammals. And then and here, the bacteria and fungi continuously break down harmful toxins and nutrients that we flush into our sewage systems or discard directly into our rivers and streams without uh, proper management. The increased the pollution will affect the aquatic and terrestrial organisms and their ecological functions. It will affect the trophic cascade in ecosystems and leads to imbalance in ecosystem functions and natural rhythm of biogeochemical cycle. Aquatic and terrestrial organisms are source of medicine, food, energy, shelter, and the raw materials that we use and need. Marine phytoplankton and algae producing oxygen for breathing. Marine biodiversity allows nature in our ocean to be productive, resilient, and adaptable to environmental changes. Marine Biodiversity can prevent one species extinction from causing wide negative impacts on a marine ecosystem. And freshwater ecosystems are essential to life on Earth. And freshwater ecosystems are important source of drinking water, water services. Freshwater ecosystem provide water for drinking, irrigation, growing crops, manufacturing, energy, and transportation. They also regulate water flow, purify water, and help prevention from flooding due to the uh, extreme strong uh, heavy rain or a storm something like that biodiversity freshwater ecosystems support more than 10 percentage of all recorded species on earth including about 30 percentage of all vertebrates and greenhouse gases healthy freshwater ecosystem produces fewer greenhouse gases and then uh, finally human rights access to freshwater is a uh, human right in precise healthy uh, biodiverse and unpolluted freshwater ecosystems produce fewer greenhouse gases and provide food, drinking water, livelihoods, modern energy systems, transport, and recreation. Alongside this, all uh, are the benefits from the uh, freshwater ecosystems. And water is one of the most important components of any ecosystem. All living organisms uh, need water to grow and survive. In an ecosystem, water cycle through the atmosphere, soil, rivers, and lakes, and oceans. Some water is stored deep in the earth. 
that is groundwater and the fresh water ecosystems and inland water bodies are such as rivers lakes wetlands and groundwater aquifers and their biodiversity are among the most threatened on the planet fresh water is a lesson or uh, earth suffers with 60 percentage of these being permanent water bodies and the remaining being occasionally in intermittent aquatic ecosystems and climate change climate change is affecting the hydrological cycle and increasing the frequency and intensity of storms these led to death loss of livelihoods and displacement and place a huge burden on a society and the climate change is affecting the hydrological cycle and increasing and uh, its intensity of storms. Over 90% of disasters are weather related, including drought and aridification, land desertification, and degradation of a soil quality, wildfires, pollution, and floods. This will affect the biodiversity on land and water in different ways. Biodiversity loss, mass death or migration, reduction of food and water availability are some of the major problems. They led to death, injury, loss of livelihoods, and displacement, and a huge burden on societies, economies, and the environment. The conservation of aquatic ecosystems. Conservation uh, that means that to conserve the wise use of natural resources such that there that there is use is sustainable long term includes the protection, preservation, management, restoration, and harvest of natural resources in sustainable way. Prevents exploitation, over exploitation, and pollution, destruction, neglect, and waste natural resources. Conservation of healthy freshwater ecosystems, which comprise wetlands such as peatlands, lakes, groundwater, aquifers, and rivers, are important to mitigate against climate change and global warming related problems. It will help to keep the planet cool, mitigate the impact of flooding by filtering and retaining water, and boost resilience through water sto storage. According to UN, blending water management and climate change adaptation approaches is one key vehicle impacts on water and avoid the worst of potential consequences for human health, economic growth, and even international relations. IWRM implementation of this is, uh, project and uh, is serving as an adaptation solution to reduce vulnerability to climate change to facilitate taking real action to reduce climate change and investing in built and natural water infrastructure such as wetland restoration, advancing governance frameworks such as water pricing, enforcing innovative regulations and economic incentives, and strengthening research information, sharing and decision support system such as early morning systems for flood and drought, and the SDG 6 clean water and sanitation that ensures availability and sustainable management of water sanitation for all. And uh, this SDG 6 focuses on ensuring a clean and stable water supply and effective water sanitation for all people by the 20 uh, year 2030. The goal is a reaction to the fact that many people throughout the world lack these basic services. About 40% of the world population is affected by the lack of water and reducing greenhouse gases to avoid the dangerous effects on climate change is an integral part of protecting freshwater resources and ecosystems. Open sea, which occupies about 90% of the total surface area of the ocean and contains about 10% of all marine plant and animal species. What is water resilience? This is the water resilience refers to the ability of water and of wastewater utilities to withstand and quickly recover from natural and human-made disasters. Increasing resilience at your utility will help safeguard access to safe drinking water and properly treated wastewater and ways to conserve water and aquatic ecosystems for sustainable living. Uh, I wish to uh, share some points here. And finding ways to conserve water will assure you a sustainable living while saving you money in energy and utility bills. And you can do your bit to save the planet also. And turn off the tap when it is not in use. Soak your dishes in warm water first. Run your dishwater and laundry only when it's full. And cut those long showers short. Use energy efficient water saving devices. Use a water softener to tackle hard water problems. Fix plumbing leaks. Go easy on your sprinkles and gardening hose. Use drip irrigation to water your plants. And reuse water for landscape gardens. And reduce the use of plastics and keep proper waste management. Don't pollute the aquatic environment. No plastic trash in beaches, riverside, or public places. Use scientific way of waste disposal. And reduce the use of artificial fertilizers, 
pesticides chemicals in farmlands or gardens and don't pollute aquatic ecosystems by waste disposal or industrial waste and plastics stop over exploitation of aquatic resources and use sustainable fishing methods restoration of degraded aquatic ecosystems and finally the education and awareness awareness is very very important to conserve our precious aquatic ecosystems for a sustainable future thank you my goodness <laughs> take it on folks <laughs> There are two slides, the, the ones that you really give us exactly what we can do from a micro level. Um, I'm hoping that we could share those. Just okay. those in and of itself would be really, really, really helpful. I think we can take the slides down. And um, I, I, once again, you know, okay. what you who you have collected here, Loretta. Um, honestly, if we can have you folks, you know, run for office, get really, really high positions <laughs> so that your impact can really, really be felt because obviously you're, you're brilliant at what you do. You know the problems intimately, you know the solutions intimately. And we, again, have all the other challenges that other people have kind of put out here in terms of um, people not listening, all the issues that we have, the, the problems that we have. So keep going, you visionaries, fabulous. Um, Loretta, we, can we, are you working to get the slides down? Uh, absolutely, I'm, I'm attempting to get the slide down now. Um, we're just waiting for uh, Dr. Gita to um, disconnect. But in the meantime, I'm going to uh, um, thank Tina so very much for her commitment, her dedication, her love for WOCPSEN. She's never, never told us no from the very time we met her. And it's really interesting because we met through the Jazzy Jays, our mentoring program. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. that was like a real exciting thing. You wanted to know, um, what could you do to help us? And you have been a part of us ever since. And we want to thank you so very, very much, Tina, for your support and your endeavors in moving us forward. Um, since I have the floor, Tina, again, thank you so very much. Um, we want to thank all of our guest speakers. We want to thank our board members that are present, which is very important because what that tells us is that what we're doing, we are globally committed to this work. This is not just about being present. It's about being present. And that's what we're saying. We're saying what we do, we walk the walk we talk. And we talk what we walk. And we're doing it constantly. We are grateful to all of you. We want to thank um, Dr. Roger because he is receiving our Legacy Award. And that was designed by our GSP president, Louis, when he came up with the concept of how legacy, historical legacy, can take us to new directions and places. He saw where we had to honor those that are doing the work so that they can continue to work, so they can take the work to the next step for the next generation to do more work. And we are honored that Dr. Roger is accepting this prestigious award that we're presenting to him and that he is doing the work and he's not stopping no matter what. And you know, there's something about everybody that's doing the work. We're not doing it for form or fashion. We're not doing it because we want accolades. We're doing it because we got to do the work. We know it's got to be done. So. We want to thank because it was a connection to all of those discourses. There's a connection. And we're grateful to that. And we just want to share with you what GSP is all about. We are about having to connect those human rights to global sustainability. Everything that has been talked about is human dignity. The right to live on this planet with dignity. Women men identified as whatever, we all have the right to live in dignity. 
And that's what we're saying. By doing this work, we can change communities one at a time. When you look at the whole picture, it might overwhelm you. You might say, I can't do this. But look at your backyard and see what you did. Amazing what you did. What did Madeline say? She did a walk. There was a woman that saw the walk. By holding the sign, it empowered her. You have the right to empower others. It is in you. If it wasn't, you wouldn't be here. If it wasn't, you wouldn't be doing the work. It's in you. We just got to keep going. One step at a time. Don't look at the whole picture. It'll, it'll profound you. But you've been gifted with a gift that you must give back. Give it back. As you see, I can talk on and on. And we're running out of time. So I'm going to give it back to Tina to close us out. But we thank you, uh, Dr. Rogers. And we're excited about giving you this award. We're thankful to all of our guest speakers. Powerful, powerful. Thank you, Tina, because you've never told us no. That's important to us. I feel that. I'm not letting that go. That means a lot to me. <laughs> Yes, Miss Reverend Loretta Williams. <laughs> She's the best. And Lewis is the best. And this organization is important. It's just the work is so, so important. And I'm going to do my best, Loretta, to kind of really kind of help you. How do we get the public relations people writing about these wonderful speakers and really getting the buzz to keep going because we're just a very small group here. And many people have signed up, I know. And a lot of times people sign up and they don't come to the live event, but they do listen. So all the re replays will go out, Every your words will be taken. And we just wanna keep it going. So what again, I'm gonna say it one more time, what I love about this, this program, and I will never say no, if you keep asking me, is not only do you have laid out the problems, you have laid out solutions. And this is what has to get out, you know, the problems that we have in the world. You know, I learned a long, long, long time ago that the reason that people fight, couples fight, countries fight, is because we don't understand each other. It's the bottom line, it's just the bottom line. And in order to be able to understand each other, we have to communicate. And we have to learn how to communicate so somebody else can listen. And if we take those basic, basic ideas and keep spreading them over and over and over again. And as you all said, as you young people said, you need an education. You know, I didn't learn all this stuff just, you know, by osmosis. I studied. I had mentors. I went to school. I got sort of certifications. I did all kinds of things to be able, because I was so hungry. Like, how do I do this? How do I survive, you know, in this in this world that is so complicated and so difficult? So your your goals to, you know, again, I I I was I'll say this. I was married to somebody who was who was Greek, and our and I'm American, and our traditions were different. The individual came second, and the, and in my culture, in the American culture, we come first. Not to be narcissistic, but so that we can give back. If I don't know who I am, if I don't know my purpose, if I'm flailing all over the place, how good am I going to be to the world? So the education, all the things that you're talking about in every aspect of what your passion is, what your gifts are, um, this is the, the legacy that we want to pass on. So thank you for the opportunity also to share my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. This will be posted on our WOCP uh, YouTube page, and it'll also be posted on our website. And then what we'll be doing is taking segments, segments and dropping it into LinkedIn, because, you know, we started on LinkedIn. We were a group, same name, same title. We started in 2009, and look where we are now. And it's not because we just wanted to do something. We knew we had to do something. So let's stay with that doing something. We appreciate all of you so very much. We want you to have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, early the next morning, wherever you are. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Many blessings and have a good day. We'll be back next year, so wait for us then. Take care. Thank you, bye. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Bye. Thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. everyone. Let's connect in LinkedIn. Thank you, everyone. Good day, Nigeria. Goodbye. <laughs>